Good evening. I'm Alan Lanham, Dean of Library Services, and we welcome you to our Grecian amphitheater that uh, if you look around, you might be able to think in your mind that's where you are. We're standing in front of the Temple of Athena, although I think the play will take us to different places uh, in Greece. I want to call your attention to the printed brochure that gives you several activities uh, coming up next week and through November the 5th that uh, concentrate on various aspects and many disciplines related to ancient Greece. And we hope that that will trigger interest uh, in your studies and whether it revolves around your courses or not, it might lead you to study abroad, it might lead you to an avenue of archaeology or performance that uh, you're not thinking of right now. So feel free to explore the various activities that are there. I hear there's some budding actors in the room, and so place yourself on the stage as the magic takes place. And thank you for coming. Ship Argo had never passed that perilous channel between the Symplegades. 
I wish the pines that made her mast and her oars still waved in the wind on Mount Pelion, and the great fish hawk still nested in them. That the great adventurers had never voyaged into the Asian sunrise, to the shores of morning for the golden fleece. For then my mistress, Medea, would never have met Jason, nor loved and saved him, nor cut herself off from this country to go with him to this country of the smiling and chattering Greeks and the roofs of Corinth over which I see evil hang like a cloud. For she is not meek, but fierce and the daughter of a king. Yet at first, all went well. The folk of Corinth were kind to her. They were proud of her beauty, and Jason loved her. Happy is the house where man and woman love and are faithful. But now all is changed. All is black hatred, for Jason has turned from Medea. She, he has married the yellow-haired child of Creon, the ruler here. He wants worldly advantage, fine friends, and a high place in court. For these, he is willing to cast Medea like a harlot and betrayed the children she had born him. He is not wise, I think. Yeah. Listen, I hear her now. Death. Death is my wish for myself, my enemies, my children. Destruction, that is the word. Grind, crush, burn, destruction. back to the children, like a fierce hound at fault. Oh, unhappy one, I am not to blame. If any god hears me, let me die. Ah, oh, rotten, 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 death is the only water to wash this dirt. Oh, it's a bad thing to be born of a high race, and to be brought up willful and powerful in a house unruled, and ruling many. For then, if misfortune comes, it is unendurable. It will drive you mad. I say that poor people are happier. The commoners and humble, humble people. The poor in spirit. For they can lie low under the wind and live. What do you want? I heard her crying again. It's dreadful. She's deep in grief and couldn't help coming. We're friends of this house. And its trouble hurts us. You are right, friends. It is not a home. It is broken. It is a house of grief and of weeping. Hear me, gods. Let me die. What I need? All dead. All dead. All dead. Under the great cold stones. For a year. And a thousand years. And another thousand. Cold as the stones. Cold, crimson cloaked in the blood of our wounds. O oh, shining sky, divine earth, hearken not to the song that this woman sings. It is not her mind's music. Her mind is not here. She does not know what she prays for. Pain and wrath are the singers. And happy one never pray for death, for he is here all too soon. He strikes from the clear sky like a hawk. He hides behind green leaves, or he will be put on the corner of a wall. Oh, never pray for death, and that prayer will be answered. I think you ought to convince Medea to come from her dark dwellings and speak with us before her heart breaks or she does harm to herself. We've lived among her. We've learned to love her, and we would gladly tell her so. It might comfort her spirit. Do you think so? She wouldn't listen. She's coming. Speak carefully to her. Make your words a song to peace. I will look at the light of the sun this last time. And I wish that from that blue sky, the great white wolf of lightning would leap down and burst my skull and my brain. And like a burning babe cling to these breasts.
to consider that I believed I was alone. And I do have some provocation. You've come, let me suppose, with love and sympathy to peer at my sorrows. You shall leave my naked heart. You know that my Lord Jason has left me and made a second marriage with a bright haired child of wealth and power. I too was a child of wealth and power. But I spent that power for the love of Jason. I poured it before him like water. I made him drink it like wine. I gave him success and fame. I saved him his precious life, not once, many times. You may have heard what I did for him. I betrayed my father for him. I killed my own brother to save him. It made my land to hate me forever. And I fled west of Jason, under the thunder of the sails, weeping and laughing, and made home to Greek waters. His home, my exile, my endless exile. And here I have loved him and bore him sons. And this man has left me and taken Creon's daughter to enjoy her fortune and put aside her soft yellow hair and kiss her young mouth. I don't know what other women I do not know how much a Greek woman will endure. But the people of my race are somewhat rash and intemperate. As for me, I wish simply to die. But Jason is not to smile at his bride above my grave, nor that great man Creon to hang wreaths and make for a feast day in Corinth. Nor those wreaths to be a bright, blinding fire and the songs a high wailing and the wine, blood. Daughter of sorrow, beware. It is dangerous to dream of wine. It is worse to speak of wailing and blood. But the images that the mind makes find a way out, and they work into life. Let them work into life. There are evils that cannot be cured by evil. Patience remains, and the gods watch all. But let them watch my enemies go down in blood. Medea makes good on her promise. When Creon comes to confront her and cast her into exile, she appeals to him and asks for a day to put her house into order. He begrudgingly grants her request, and that seals his doom. Invoking her witchcraft, Medea sends her own sons to deliver to Creon's daughter, Creusa, gifts of a golden robe and crown, which would not fulfill Medea's prophecy of a fiery vengeance. As the scene opens, Medea awaits the return of the nurse so that she might hear the extent of her destructive power. Old friend, Catch your breath, take your time. I want the whole tale, every gesture and cry. I have labored for this. Death is turned loose. I have hobbled and run and fallen. Please, nurse, go slowly. Tell me these things from the beginning. You used to, when I was a child in my father's house, you used to say one thing at a time, one thing and then the next. My eyes are blistered. My throat is like a dry straw. There was a long mirror on the wall. And when her eyes saw it, when she put her hands in that little case and took out those gold things, and I watched, for I feared something might happen to her. But I never thought so horribly. She placed that gold wreath on her tiny head, and wrapped those long gold robes around her white shoulders and slender flanks. And she gazed at the girl in the metal mirror, going back and forth on tiptoe almost. But then, horror began. I, you are not suffering. You saw it. You did not feel it. Speak plainly. Her face went white. She staggered, bending over, and fell into that great throne chair. Then a serving woman called for water, thinking that she had fainted. But then she saw the foam start on her lips and the eyes rolling, and screamed instead. Then some ran to 
fetch Jason, and others ran after Creant. And that doomed girl, frightfully crying, started up in her chair. She was like a torch. And that, that gold crown, like a comet, streamed fire. She tore at it, but it clung to her head. The golden robes were white hot, flayed flesh from living bones. Blood mixed with fire ran down. She fell. She burned on the floor, writhing. Then Creon came and he flung himself on her, hoping to choke that rage of flame. But it burned through him. His own agony made him forget his daughters. Fire stuck to the flesh. It glued him to her. He tried to stand up. He tore her body and his own. The burnt flesh broke in love from the bone. I have finished. They lie there, eyeless, disfaced. Untouchable minutes of smoking flesh. I have no more. I want all. Had they died when you came away? No. The breath still whistled in the black mouths. No one could touch them. And Jason, he stood in their smoke, tearing his unhelmeted hair. As for those people, they will soon die. Their woes are over too soon. Jason's are not. The deaths of Creon and Creusa have given Medea a certain sense of justice, but her vengeance is not yet complete. The nurse and the women urge her to take her children and flee, telling her that fire and death have done your bidding. Is it not enough? Medea responds, no. Loathing is endless. Hate is a bottomless cup. I will pour and pour. Her focus now turns to the children. She asks, <clears throat> Would you say this child has Jason's eyes? They are his cubs. They have his blood. And as long as they live, I shall be mixed with him. Children, it is evening. See, evening has come. And evening brings all things home. It brings the bird to the bow, and the lamb to the fold, and the child to the mother. We mustn't think too much. People go mad if they think too much. The women plead with Medea to spare the children, but it is in vain. Unaware of what has transpired in his own home, Jason rushes in, determined to confront and kill Medea for what she has done to Creon and Creusa. Instead, Medea confronts him. Her gown stained with the blood of the precious sacrifice she has made. What feeble night bird, overcome by misfortune, beats at my door? Can this be that great adventurer, the famous lord of the seas and delight of women, the heir to rich Corinth? You've not had enough. You've come to drink the last bitter drops. I'll pour them for you. Why that was pouring spilled on my hand. Dear were the little grapes that were crushed to make it. Dear were the vineyards. Now hush. Your sons are sleeping. Perhaps I will let you look at them, but you cannot have them. But the hour grows late. You ought to go home to that high-born bride. The night is fallen. Surely she longs for you. Surely her flesh is not crusted black, nor her forehead burned bald, nor her mouth all <coughs> horn. She is very young, but surely she loves and desires you. Surely she will be fruitful. I will let you look at your sons. Open the doors that he may see them. I have done it. I killed them. I did it because I loathed you more than I loved them. I tore my own heart and laughed 
because I was tearing yours. And I would still laugh, and I would still be joyful to know that every bone of your body is broken. You are left friendless, mateless, childless. Now go down to your ship, Marco, and weep beside it. That rotting hulk on the harbor beach drawn dry a strand, never to be launched again. Even the barnacles on the warped keel are dead and stink. That is your last companion. And only hope for some time one of the rotting timbers will fall on your head and kill you. Meanwhile, sit there and mourn, remembering the infinite evil the good that you made. Face him, Mamie, 
if you dishonor their laws. Dishonor them I do not, but nor am I strong enough to defy the laws of the land. Live then, and live with your choice. I am going to bear his body. Antigone, I fear for you. Better fear for yourself. You are mad. You don't stand a chance. Here. And now, is me. I hate you for this talk, and the dead are going to hate you. Call me mad if you like, but leave me alone to do it. If Creon has killed me, where is the disgrace in that? The disgrace would be to avoid it. Nothing's going to stop you, sister. But nothing's going to stop the ones that love you from keeping on loving you. <coughs> Defying Creon's edict, Antigone attempts to bury her brother. When she is caught after her second attempt, she is brought to face Creon's wrath. Now what has happened? Is this the work of the gods, Antigone, child of doom? Have you gone and broken the law? This is the one we caught already, attending to the corpse. Where is Creon gone? Creon knows when he is needed. He's coming now. Needed? Why am I needed? King Creon, sir, we found her attending to the corpse, and I was on her in a flash. My prisoner and my own. And now, sir, she is yours. To judge and convict. How did you find her? <laughs> Attending to the corpse, you said nobody was to bury. Will that do? How was she observed and caught? Describe it. I'll describe it. Gladly. I went back to the watch, and we did what we could. We cleaned the body down and removed the clothing. It was starting to go off, so we stationed ourselves around the hill, you know, because of the smell. And then what happens? Leaves whipped out of trees, flying sand and dust, like the sky was vomiting black air. We braced ourselves for whatever plague it was the gods were sending. But then it clears, and this one standing there, crying her eyes out. And when she sees the bare quartz, she lets out a screech and starts to curse whoever did the deed. She lifted the dust from her hands and let it fall. She poured the water from her urn three times, taking care to do the whole thing right. Showed no signs of panic when we came upon her. Denied no thing she was accused of doing then or earlier. You there, studying the ground, hold up your head and tell us, is this true? True. I admit it. All right, you're in the clear. So now clear off. Tell us, did you or did you not know that the proclamation forbade all this? I did not. How could I not? And yet still you dared to disobey the law. I disobeyed because the law was not the law of Zeus, nor the law ordained by justice. Justice dwelling deep among the gods of, of the dead. Well, I do humor you or honor gods. Sooner or later, I will die anyhow, and sooner may be better in my case. This death penalty is almost a relief. This wildness in her comes from Oedipus. She gets it from her father. She won't relent. We'll wait and see. The bigger the resistance, the bigger the collapse. Get his mania out here. She was inside the house a while ago, raving <coughs> out of her mind. That's how guilt affects some people. They simply break and everything comes out. But the barefaced the ones who defy you even more when they're found out, they're worse again. Will it be enough for you to see me executed? More than enough. Then why don't you do it quickly? Anything I have to say to you are you to be only deep into the wound. I never did a nobler thing than to bury my brother Polynices. His mating in tears for her sister and for herself. Tell us, you, now. You helped her, didn't you? Or are you going to claim that you're innocent? I helped her, yes, if I'm allowed to say so. And now I stand with her to take what comes. I don't allow the justice, won't allow it. You wouldn't help me cut all ties is over. But now I'm with you. I want to throw myself to you like a lifeline in your sea of troubles. Too late, my sister. You chose a safe line first. The dead in Hades know who did this deed. Antigone, don't rob me of all honor. Let me die with you and do right by the dead. You can't just pluck honor off a bush you didn't plan to forfeit the rights. If Antigone
Antigone dies, how will I keep on living? You can save yourself. That is my honest wish. And be forever shaved in my own eyes? Take heart in me. You are still alive. But I have long gone over to the dead. This is incredible. One of them had the father's madness in her from the start. But I had never thought to see it in his mania. My sister is the mainstay of my life. Your sister is. Was. There is no is anymore. You mean you'd kill your own son's bride to be? I would and will. He has other fields to plow. He loves her utterly. For him there is no one else. No son of mine will take a condemned wife. Poor, poor Haman. To have you as a father. You and your marriage talk. Too late for that. But you mean, sir, you will rob Haman of this woman? Hades will rob him first. But the sentence, though, has been decided on? It has, by me. And I, may I remind you, have your acclamation. Women were never meant for this assembly. Get her out of here, and the other one. From now on, they'll be kept in place again. And better be. Yes, keep an eye on them. Once the end's in sight, they all get desperate. Even the bravest will make a run for it. Creon. So adamant his condemnation of Antigone is soon to discover the ill effects of ignoring wise counsel. Is this more bad news for the royal house? Dead. They are all dead, and the living bear the guilt. Who was killed? Who did the killing? Haman was killed. But by himself or Creon? By himself, for the blood of his father's hands. I can tell you the whole thing. Right from the start, I was at Creon's side, marching up that hill. And sure enough, it was still there, Polynices' corpse, for what the dogs had left of it. So we prayed to the goddess of the crossroads and to Pluto to ignore the pitilessness of that desecration, and we washed the remains of purifying water. We gathered enough sticks to burn him decently and piled his home ground over him at last, as was proper. And on we marched, right up to that cave mouth, and deep in that un unholy bulk we hear such a howling that we have to send for Creon. And when Creon comes, he howls himself before he knows. Hide me, hide me from myself, he cries. I hear my son's voice in there. Tell me, tumble the, tumble the stones, tell me, look inside, tell me if it's Haman. We tumble the stones and peer inside the gallery. And sure enough, Antigone is there, hanging by a linen noose from her neck. Haman has his arms around the girl's waist, imploring the underworld, lamenting his de dead bride, and shouting execrations against Creon. Creon can't help himself and runs to the boy with open arms. Haman spat in his face and made a lunge at him with his two-edged sword and would have gotten him too if Creon had dodged. And before we know it, he turned that sword up himself and punched it into his side. <clears throat> As the darkness fell over his eyes, blood came spurting out of his mouth, all over her white cheek. That was the kiss he gave his bride to be, a wedding witness in the halls of death, the one to teach us living witnesses the mortal cost of ill-judged words and Stand back. It is the king coming to bury his own. How did the likes of us foresee this and not him? Behold, your king of wrong, <coughs> wrong headed on the throne, wrong headed in the home, wrong footed by the heavens, too late, and the last burned. My lord, you can bow down with grief, but you must brace yourself to suffer more. What can be worse than worse? What has happened now? The one who brought your son into this world has taken leave of it. Your queen's life blood is on the palace floor. Why am I clamped like prey in the hungry jaws of death? Mother and child, both. I have wived and fathered death. No, my lord. She dealt the stroke herself. The sword was two-edged, and so was her grief. And as the darkness stole over her eyes, she called you death dealer and cursed your name. Why doesn't someone take a two-edged sword to me? Death dealer, she said, because you and your dealings fell her children. And then she raised her hand to do the deed. When she heard how Haman killed himself, she went and took your sword from the scabbard and plunged it into her heart. Let all verdicts be pronounced. She was guiltless. 
It was my hand on the hilt. My hand that drove the blade. This is right, if any right could come from wrongs like yours. This is good. When the worst has to be faced, the best thing is to face it quickly. The quicker it comes, the better. I want to hurry death. I want to be free of the dread of wakening in the morning. Everything that I have touched, I have destroyed. I have no one to turn to, nowhere I can go. My recklessness and pride I paid for in the end. The blow came quick. Wise conduct is the key to happiness. Always live by the gods and reverence them. Those who overbear will be brought to grief. Fate will flail them on its winnowing floor, and in due season teach them to be wise. as the most tragic of the poets. If what Aristotle meant was that Euripides possessed the greatest capacity in general for provoking pity and fear, then the Trojan women, one of the greatest pieces of anti-war literature ever written, must also rank as one of the greatest European tragedies with its tale of the destructive nature of war. First performed on the Athenian stage in 416 BC, its denunciation of terror and futility of war makes this play from a faraway age amazingly and sadly contemporary. The play has no plot and almost no action, but it frames the impact of war on all levels of society with a pathos worthy of the poet of the world's grief, as Euripides was called. Before the ruined walls of ancient Troy, after the battle in which King Menelaus of Sparta and Agamemnon, general of the Greeks, had taken the city, there appears dimly in the early dawn the mourning figure of the god Poseidon. Bodies of dead warriors lie before the huts of the captive women, who await disposition among the Greek leaders. And a white-haired woman is laying on the ground. It is Hecuba, queen of Troy, the wife of Priam and mother of Hector and Paris. Poseidon laments the destruction of the Trojan Wall, which he and Apollo had built, and cries that Priam lies unburied by his own hurt, while the captive women wail, and the victors await the winds that will take them to their homes. He reflects that Helen, the wife of Menelaus, whom Paris had brought to Troy, also awaits in a hut, a prize of war. That Hecuba's child, Polyxena, has been secretly slain, and Priam and his sons are gone, while her daughter, Cassandra, the virgin seeress and beloved of Apollo, has been marked as a prize of Agamemnon. The goddess, Pallas Athena, appears, and with Poseidon conspires to destroy the home-going Greek ships in revenge. Poseidon cries to the conquerors, How are ye blind, ye treaders down of cities? Ye that cast temples to desolation and lay waste tombs, the untrodden sanctuaries where lie the ancient dead, yourselves so soon to die. The dawn comes, and Hecuba awakens to mourn her tragic fate and curse Helen as the cause. The other captive women rise to echo her cries. Up from the ground, O oh weary head, O oh breaking neck, this is no longer Troy. And we, not the lords of Troy, endure, for the ways of fate are the ways of the wind. Drift with the stream, drift with fate. No use to turn the prow to breast the waves. Let the boat go as it chances. Sorrow, my sorrow, what sorrow is there that is not mine? Grief to weep for. Country lost, and children, and husband. Glory of all my house brought low. All was nothing. Nothing always. And what did they come for? A woman? A thing of loathing, of shame to husband, to brother, to home? She slew Priam, father of fifty sons. She wrecked me upon the reef of destruction. Who am I that I wait at a Greek king's door? A slave that men drive on. Old, homeless, and without children. Shaven head brought low in dishonor. O oh, wives of the bronze are men who fought, and maidens, sorrowing maidens, plighted to shame. See, only smoke left where was Troy. O oh, Hecuba, your cry, 
We heard you fall so piteously, and through our hearts flashed fear, for we too were slaves. Look, child, there, where the Greek ships wait. They are moving. The men hold oars. God, what will they do? Carry me off on a ship far away from home? You ask, and I know nothing. I think ruins here. Oh, we are wretched. We shall hear the summons. Women of Troy, go forth from your home, for the Greeks set sail. Oh, but not Cassandra. No, not her. She is mad. She has been driven mad. Leave her with it. Not shame before the Greeks. Not that grief, too. I have enough. Out of a Greek king's pen, trembling, I come, my queen, to hear my fate from you, not death. Anything but death for a poor woman. Sailors, they are standing on the prow. Already they are running out the oars. It is so early. But a terror woke me. My heart beats so. Has a herald come from the Greek camp? Whose slave shall I be? Wait for the lot drawing. It's near. My sons, I look to you once more. Never again. Or oh, worst off, the Greeks bed and I. A night like that. Oh no, not that for me. I see myself a water carrier, dipping my feet into the great Pyrrhian spring, the land of Theseus, Athens. It is known to be a happy place. I wish I could go there. But not the Erotus. Not there. Hateful river, where once Helen lived. Not there. To become a slave to Menelaus, who sat Troy. And whose slave am I? Creeping along with my crutch. The crushing news of Hecuba's fate is unwillingly brought by the Greek herald of Talphidius. He informs Hecuba that Cassandra is to be the bride of Agamemnon, hints that Polyxena is dead, and reveals that Andromach, the wife of Hector, is to be the prize of Pyrrhus, Achilles' son. Hecuba herself is fated to be the slave of the despised Odysseus, king of Ithaca. Beat, beat my shorn head, and tear, tear my cheek, his slave, vile, lying man. I have come to this. There is nothing good he doesn't hurt, a lawless beast. Pity me, women of Troy, for I have gone, and I am lost, and evil fate has fallen. The lot, the hardest of all. My husband, you ponder, unburied, uncared for, lost what flame ships shall carry me over to the land that the riders love. And children, our children, at the gate they are crying. Crying, calling to us, Mother, I am alone. They are carrying me off into a black ship, and I cannot see you. Where? Oh, where? To holy Salamis, with swift oars dipping? Or to the crest of Corinth, the city of two seas? Oh, if only far out to see the crashing thunder of God would fall down, down on Menelaus' ship. He, it was, drove me from Troy. He is dragging me in tears over to Greece to slavery. Cassandra appears bearing a torch, and walking is in a dream of her bridal garment. She chants dire prophecies of the Greeks' empty victory with death for Agamemnon and the dark wanderings of Mother Murder that shall destroy the house of Atreus. She becomes conscious of the awe of Talthibius, and tearing off her garlands, goes to the house of death to lie beside my bridegroom. With the final word of comfort for her city and for Hecuba, who collapses to the ground, broken. A chariot approaches from town, laden with spoils and bearing a mourning woman who holds a child in her arms. Andromach, the widow of Hector and her baby. Andromach, crying her grief to him, but calls down God wrath on Paris, who sold for his evil love Troy and the towers thereof. She confirms to the agonized Hecuba that Pelexina has been slain at Achilles too. Andromach asks how she can become the wife of Achilles' son without shame to herself and her beloved Hector. But her Hecuba counsels that she honor her new lord and thus perhaps be permitted to rear her son as a future savior of Ilion. But the gentle Talthibius returns with news that Odysseus has prevailed in counsel in order that the child is to be dashed to death from the wall.
If Audremont casts the curse upon any of the Greek ships, the baby is to have no burial. The stricken mother, calling a curse upon Helen, addresses her baby. Go, die, my best beloved, my cherished one. Hence, hence, go, die, my best beloved, my cherished one. In strong men's hands, leaving me here alone, weepest thou? Nay, thou canst not know that thy father will not come. He will not come. How shall it be? One spring deep, deep down in thy neck. Oh, God, so come and sleep, and none to pity thee. Thou sweet little thing that curlest in my arms. What sweet scents cling to thy neck? Now kiss me, lips to lips. Quick, take him, drag him, cast him from the wall. To the bridal, I have lost my child, my own. Andromach, half swooning, is driven to the ships, and the soldiers bear the child to his death. When Hector fought and thousands at his side, we fell beneath you. And now, with country captured and the Trojans dead, a child like this has made you afraid. Oh, the fear that comes when reason goes. Myself, I don't wish to share it. Poor little one, how savagely our ancient walls, Apollo's towers, have torn away the pearls your mother's fingers wound, and where she pressed her soft kisses, where the bone grins white. In dear hands, the same dear shape your fathers have, how loosely now they fall. And dear proud lips forever closed. False words you would speak to me when you would jump into my bed and tell me, Grandmother, when you die, I will cut off a great lock of hair and leave all my men to ride out past your tomb. Not you, but I, old, homeless, must bury you. So young, so miserably dead. They've taken all that was your father's, but one thing you will have for your burial. The bronze bird's shield. It kept safe Hector's mighty arm, but now it has lost its master. Come. Bring such coverings as we have for the pitiful body. God has not left us much to make a show with, but everything I have I give you, child. Go and lay our dead in his grave these last gifts given to him. I think those that are dead care little how they're buried. It is we the living, our vanity. Terrible. The fire, it lights the whole town up. The inside rooms are all burning. The citadel, it's all flame now. Troy is vanishing. War first ruined her. And now the rest is going up in smoke. The glorious house is falling. First the spear, and then the fire. My knees are stiff, but I must kneel. Now I strike the ground with both of my hands. I too, I kneel upon the ground. I halt to lie down there, husband. My poor husband. They are hurting us like cattle, driving us out. Pain. Oh, pain. From my country. Priam, Priam, you are dead and not a friend left to bury you. The evil that has found me. Do you know? No. Death has darkened his eyes. He was good and the wicked killed him. Fall and be forgotten. Earth is kind. The dust is rising, spreading like a great wing of smoke. I can't see my house. The name has vanished from the land. And we are gone. One here, one there. And Troy is gone forever. With a great crash, the city wall is lost in smoke and darkness, signaling the fall of Troy. Earthquake and flood and the city's end. My limbs are weak. But you must carry me on to the new day of slavery. Bear well, dear city. Bear once 
Farewell, my country, where once my children live. There below, the Greek ships wait. 